you and uh, we know that you've already felt the presence of the Lord and the love of the Lord and we pray that you will also feel the love of God's family this morning we're so glad that you're here for those of you lighthouse folks you've been away you've been traveling you've been going hither and yon we're really glad you're back we've missed you as well you've been gone too long and too far so we're glad to have you folks back <clears throat> uh, this morning as we turn to the word of the Lord hang on let me get my watch out so I can keep in good time. It, so it's too obvious if I look up there to check my time, you know, but if I look right there, it's not quite so obvious, is it? Now you're all, now you're all going to look whenever I look there. <laughs> so uh, this morning as we turn to the word of the Lord, um, I want to, want to bring to you what God has put on my heart for us as a church, for as, as a gathering uh, this morning. The Lord knew every one of us that was going to be here this morning. And whenever we gather in his name and whenever we acknowledge him and we lift him up in our, in our midst and in our, pre in, in our gatherings, the Lord always speaks to us. He's not a silent God. He's not a quiet God. God talks to us. We don't always hear him. Um, but God always speaks. God always communicates with us. And so this morning I want to, uh, I have a very simple message, keys to overcoming. You're, I don't think you're going to hear anything you haven't heard before. I don't think you're going to hear anything you don't know. Nevertheless, this is the word of the Lord for us this morning. And so I want to talk this morning about keys to overcoming. We finished with 2019. To tell you the truth, for me, I really had tunnel vision and I was just thinking it's a new year it's a new year but then as I started looking online and listening to others I realized it's a new decade it's a new decade now some of you probably have more long-term vision than I have and you were already thinking it's a new decade it's a new decade it is a new decade um, and a new year and we want to get through this year and we want to get through this decade should our Lord Jesus tarry we want to get through victoriously, don't we? We want to get through as overcomers. And we look back at this last year, and I think all of us would say as we look back, there are areas of our lives, there are times in our lives, there are things in our lives where we overcame, and we're so glad and we're so thankful. And yet there are other places in our lives where we, instead of being overcomers, we were overcome this last year, right? Would you say, I would say that about my life, and I think most of us would say that. What I want to say this morning is this. God has steps, God has keys for us to overcome. The Christian life, go ahead and settle it in your heart. We will be overcomers or we will be overcome. There's not really a middle ground. It's going to be one or the other. And God has tools and keys and steps for us through which, by which, we may overcome in a world that is often difficult, in a world where we face troubles and trials and hard times and things that we don't understand, things, mountains that seem too high to climb and too wide to get around. Our God, our Father who loves us, has keys and tools for us to be overcomers in such a in such a world. Um, in uh, first, let me see if I wrote, I don't think I wrote it down. I think it's in the beginning of Second Peter. Uh, I think maybe it's verse three. Second Peter one verse uh, chap uh, chapter one verse three. Peter writes, the Apostle Peter writes, he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. What a mind-blowing scripture, isn't it? He's given us everything we need. I don't know about you, sometimes I feel like I don't have everything I need. Do you feel that way sometimes? I feel like, oh God, sure we do. The pastors are saying it the loudest. We do, we sometimes feel like I, I, don't, I don't have it. But I want us to look today at the Word of God and what He says to us about how we can appropriate, how we can see and understand and have in our lives everything that we need for life and godliness in this new year, in this new decade. Our God is with us and He will help us, 
be overcomers. He's a loving Heavenly Father. So I want to just go through some things, and we're just going to look at it together. If I'd had more time, and if I hadn't finished up at 1245 last night, I would have printed you something so you could have written it down. But since we have a great IT team, you can go back and listen again if you'd like to. Um, this, you know, I used to teach uh, in university, used to teach English in university, and I would always have some students that had... Uh, we call them Cliff's Notes. I don't know what you call them in other countries, but it's kind of like the dummy's guide to something, something, something. You know, it's the, it's the easy, it's the summary, it's the easy thing. In a way, this is, this is what this is. There's much more here than we can look at this morning, but I just want to share with you a few, thi few things this morning. So the first key to overcoming is to stay in the truth, to stay in the truth. Now you may say, do you mean stay in the Word of God? We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But I want to approach it a little bit differently. And this is what the Lord put on my heart first as I was preparing this message and as He was speaking to me through this week during our time of fasting and prayer. Stay in the truth. Think with me all the way back to the beginning. Uh, in, during, uh, just after creation, when God had made Adam and Eve and He put them in a garden in which He had provided everything they needed for life and godliness, right? Everything they needed. And he has restored that to us through Jesus Christ. But in the garden, they had everything they needed, and God walked with them. His presence was with them. And then the serpent, the enemy, came to Adam and Eve, and what did the, what did the serpent do? What did the enemy do? The enemy began to question. He said, did God really say this? And he attacked truth, didn't he? What God had said, what was true. And if we go back and look at it, the other thing that we see is that when he attacks truth, what the enemy was really attacking was the character and the nature of God, right? In other words, did God really say this? Oh, well, God, God just doesn't want you to know everything. God, God doesn't, if you, if you did this, then you would know what God knows. And the thought and the suggestion came that God was withholding something good from Adam and Eve, from his creation. And they, they bit the worm. They thought they bit the worm and the hook got them. And they fell into temptation. And brothers and sisters, may I say to you, the enemy is not very creative. He keeps the same, he follows the same pattern with us today. What I want to say to you is this, and I really want to stress it, and I was thinking uh, the Lord really brought that to mind as we were worshiping the Lord this morning, um, as we were singing to Him, and as His presence was ministering to us. We go through things this year. Some of you have gone through things in this last year that were very, very hard, that tore your life apart or are tearing your life apart, that changed everything in your life. And... And I don't just mean Steve. There are others in the church as well. Um, that you're going through things or you've gone through things that are really hard for you to understand. And the temptation, the enemy comes to us in times like this. Listen carefully. He comes to us. It doesn't sound like the enemy. The serpent didn't sound like the devil. The serpent didn't come with horns and a forked tail or anything like that. He came in a form that was innocuous. He came in a pleasing form. He came in a form that uh, disarmed them. So they didn't, they, their, their guard wasn't up. And sometimes these thoughts and these questions come to us and we think sometimes it just sounds like our own voice, doesn't it? Sometimes it just sounds like, well, that's reasonable. And the enemy comes to us in hard times, in difficult times. In times that we do not understand and we can't figure out, God, why is this happening? God, you could so easily do something about this. God, you could have kept this from happening. And in our sadness and in our darkness, because we don't understand what's going on, we can begin to question God, God, do you really care? God, do you really love me? If you really loved me, couldn't you do something about this? Wouldn't you do something about this? And it's the same, it's the same temptation that the enemy tempted Adam and Eve with in the very beginning. It's the character and the nature of God. So what do we do? Because we want to overcome, don't we? 
And some of us feel like we are being overcome right now, don't we? We just feel like, I don't know if I can make it through or not. How can we overcome in times like this? We overcome by staying in the truth. We all know the most famous verse in the Bible. What verse is it? John 3.16. I think that's the most famous verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then after that in John, uh, in verse 17, it says, For Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be, might be saved, might be saved, might believe and might be saved. And you say, well, pastor, that's a salvation message. That's a salvation verse. It is a salvation ver verse, but I want you to look at it in this way with me this morning. You and I cannot understand some of the things that we go through, some of the things that we're struggling with right now. So here's our experience. And it seems like it doesn't measure up with the Word of God and what God says. So go back to what you do know. And what you and I do know is that for God loved you so much, He gave you Jesus. He came into the world not to condemn. Did you deserve condemnation? You bet you did. Did I deserve condemnation? You bet I did. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when I talked about the gift of grace, that God gives us mercy and he gives us grace. Mercy is not receiving what we deserve, which is condemnation, which is judgment, which is punishment. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. It's his love. It's his forgiveness. His, it is his acceptance. So when you go through these hard times and these difficult times and you think, I don't think I can overcome, I am being overcome. I want to urge you, go back to some of the simple things and some of the foundation things and this foundation thing in God's word. He loves you. You're going through a time and you think, I don't understand. God, do you really love me? And God says to you again, in your heart of hearts, in your darkest night, he says, I gave you Jesus. I gave you Jesus. I love you. I am for you. I'm not against you. I'm not angry with you. I'm pleased with you. And silence the voice of the enemy when those questions come and you will overcome. Stay in the truth. That, that verse we know so well. I, I, may I give you a practical suggestion? Something, if you're struggling in this area, get a notebook and just go to the Word of God in your daily readings or just take extra time and just go through and just begin reading. And everywhere you read something about God's love for you, the grace that Jesus has for you, just write it down. Just write it down and, and meditate on that and look over it. It will make a difference in your life. A little bit later, we're going to talk about stay in the Word. And we're not going to, I took it out of my, it was half a page. I took it out of my notes last night. Um, because I looked at it and I thought, got too much to cover here this morning. But in Romans 12, 2, it says uh, your, that our lives, to, that don't be conformed to the world around you, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's Romans 12, 2. And the renewing of your mind is done it happens through the Word of God. It, that's, that will renew your mind as the Holy Spirit works. It's, it's not just a dead word on the page. The Holy Spirit, who is the living God, the Word of God, which came from God and is an expression of God, comes into our hearts and in our lives, and it transforms us. You know what the word transform means? And I didn't, ta I didn't put these scriptures up. It's Romans 12, 2. You can go back and read it on your own. Uh, 12, 12, Romans 12, 1, 2, and 3. The word uh, be transformed is actually the word from which, uh, that's the original word, and from it we have the word metamorphosis. That's what the word means in the original Greek. And it means an inner transformation. I don't know about you, but I was praying this morning. Sometimes I just think, oh God, change my mind. Change the way I think. Do you ever want the Lord to change the way you think? I do. Sometimes I just think, oh, oh God, change my mind. And his word, as I, as I get into his word, his word will transform my mind. And so if you are, if there are areas that you're struggling, honestly, this is, it's a, it sounds really simple. I, 
I can encourage you. Don't worry, that, those are happy sounds. That's a happy baby. <laughs> That's right. That doesn't bother me one bit. I love the sound of happy babies in church. <laughs> Amen. Um, praise the Lord. Uh, but if you are struggling certain areas, struggling in certain areas, and you are feeling overcome, I really mean it. Just get a notebook and say, okay, Lord, take me to your word. Lord, help me to understand. Transform my mind through your word. And just start writing down scriptures that, that are opposite of the lies that the enemy is whispering into your heart and into your ear as you go through things. Amen? Amen. Amen. So get it settled. Stay in the truth. God loves you this year. God loves you. Why do you need to hear this so much? Because you're going to go through some tough times. And I'm going to go through some tough times as well. And so you and I need to get it settled. We've got we to get on firm ground as we start. We do. And the Word of God is always firm ground. Amen? It's always firm ground. Amen. This verse you know so very well. So we're just, we, we, how many of you have this verse memorized? Yeah? Okay, a lot of us do. So we don't even have to, I won't even, we don't even have to go through it. I'm just skating on it as we go over it. But here's a reminder for you. As we face a new year and a new decade, God says, I have plans for you. Some of you feel like I ain't got no plans. You, you kind of feel like things have ground to a halt. But God says he has plans for you, and there are plans to prosper you. God wants to do something good in your life this year. God wants to do something good through your life this year. It may not look like you hope. It may not look like you have planned, but God says, I have a plan for you. And it's a good plan, right? It's a good plan to prosper you, not to harm you. You see, you and I go through hard times and we think, God, what are you doing? And the enemy is there to whisper so that we question God and get us off his truth and onto shaky ground. Anytime we're off the word of God, we get onto shaky ground and the enemy can knock us off our feet, right? He surely can. He surely can. And so, God, so get it. Stay in the truth this year. Plans to give you hope and a future. Some of us this morning cannot see beyond our struggle. Some of us cannot see beyond our difficulties right now. Our God, your loving Father, sees all the way through. And he sees that there's hope for you. And he sees that there's a future for you. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. He, God has a hope and a future for you this year, this year. And so God is for you and he loves you. You know this verse as well. I looked at this. I love on you, what you can do if you want to. If you're, if you're struggling in this area, go back and read Romans 8. The whole chapter. We're just, I'm just picking a few. If God is for us, who can be against us? It's a rhetorical question, by the way. If God is for us, God is for you this year. And you need to stand on that solid ground. You need to stay in that truth because you're going to face things that will feel like God is against you. You will. You will. And so will I. You know, when Paul came to the end of his life and he was writing to his young uh, son in the faith, Timothy, remember what Paul said? He said, I have fought the good fight. He did not say, I have danced the good dance. I've waltzed the good waltz. I've walked the good, the good walk. Paul said, I've fought the good fight. It, it was a fight. And there are times when it's just a fight, brothers and sisters. It's not always a fight, but there are times when it is. And so settle it in your hearts and settle it in your mind that as you go through this fight this year, God is for you. He's for you in whatever you're going through. Whatever you're facing, God is for you. He's with you in that battle. He's with you in that valley. He's with you in this hard time. He's with you in this time of darkness. He's with you. He's for you. And close your ears. Stop agreeing with the enemy and start agreeing with God. If God is for us, who can be against us? And I didn't put the verse up there for sake of time, but on your own, you go back and read verse 32. As soon as Paul says this, in the very next verse, he says, If God did not spare his own son, this goes back to John 3.16 again, doesn't it? For God so loved the world. If God gave us Jesus, will he not give us all things, everything as we go through, as we go through these things? 
And then verse 35, who shall separate us? What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, look at all these tough things, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. Some of us are going through something that feels like this. Some of us are going through things maybe not that hard. We go through these things and here is the promise of God. I am so glad that Paul is the one that wrote this because he went through these things, didn't he? Pretty much all these things. And Paul is the one who writes from experience inspired of the Spirit. He says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. You shall be an overcomer this year. I don't know how long the battle will last. It may last longer than 2020. You shall be an overcomer as you stand in the truth of God. He loves you. He's with you. He's for you. Amen? Amen. 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 So there's the first one. Stay in the truth. Next one. Stay close to God. Okay, you say, oh, this isn't very deep this morning, Pastor Jennifer. I know that. But it's the truth, and it's what we need this morning. So the first one is stay in the truth. The second one is stay close to God. Now, I could give you, oh, maybe half the Bible for this. So I'm, I really prayed yesterday as I was preparing, and I took out scriptures, and I added some scriptures because there's so many scriptures we could say. So I just have a few for you this morning, and you know this one. Stay close to God. Look with me at Psalm 91. If you are struggling this morning, I encourage you... Um, if you are feeling attacked and overcome, I encourage you to go to Psalm 91 and meditate on Psalm 91. Memorize Psalm 91. That's a great psalm. And some, of you, some of you may have, and I've only done part of it, but it is so, so good. So stay close to God. Why stay close to God? You say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, you're just saying that because you're a pastor. Yes, I'm saying it because I'm a pastor. And, you're, and I'm, I'm an under-shepherd. And you're the sheep that are here today. Yes, stay close to God. Why? I want you to make it. I want to make it. I want to get to the end of this year and see every one of you still sitting there with smiles on your faces, not having, fa not having fallen away, not having been overcome, but making it. Psalm 91 says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I like that, don't you? Not just those that come in whenever they need a little bit of help. Oh, God! Let me get close and then go off. You know, like some of my cats. You know, I haven't used a cat explanation in a long time. So here you go. One of my cats loves me sometimes, but not all the time. And sometimes the cat will come close and sit for a while and then runs off again as soon as I try to pet it or whatever. Um, and that's, maybe that's a poor example, but I... What a different picture we have here in Psalm 91, verse 1. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. You see, the enemy wants to drive you. He wants to drive you. He wants you running and out of breath and fearful and looking for any place of refuge. And the psalmist said, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And there you will find safety. And there you will find rest. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Do you think as you are living in the shelter and under the shadow of the Most High that you're going to be overcome by evil? There's no way. There's no way. It, how many of you... How, how many of you, those of you who are parents, something frightens your child and your child, especially when they're younger, and they come running to you for comfort, don't they? They come running and they, and they get up close to you. You're going to let whatever it is that's frightening them, you're, you're going to let that frighten them more or scare them or grab them. Never in a million years. And we are imperfect parents. How much more our Heavenly Father Surely he will save you from every trap and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you'll find refuge. This picture of, a, of a, maybe a mother hen that's completely covering all the chicks. 
His faithfulness will be your armor and protection. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the, nor the plague that destroys at midday. And here's this beautiful picture when we're close to him, that we're under his protection and that there's rest in that. And in this picture, we look at this, and when we look at the Old Testament, a lot of times, the pictures that we see of God and his relationship with his people, it's very often a physical thing, something that we can see outwardly. And that is true, but so often in the Old Testament, it's actually an outward picture of what the Lord does for us on the inside with our hearts and with our, with our spirits and with our souls. And it's this beautiful picture of God who preserves us and protects us. So stay close to God this year. Stay close to Him. Think, for, think with me for just a minute. What is the most iconic picture in the whole Bible of the relationship between God and His people? Think for just a minute. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. We see it in Psalm 23. We see it, that's right, we see it when Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the door to the sheepfold. When Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. Here's this picture of a shepherd and a sheep. Think about it with staying close to God, staying close to Jesus. Do you know how a shepherd leads his sheep? He doesn't lead by sight. He doesn't lead by beating. He doesn't lead by driving. If sheep are driven, they will scatter. He leads by his voice, by his voice. Get close enough to Jesus so that you hear his voice, so that you hear his voice. And it's the safest place. It's the safest place to be. The sheep that is closest to the shepherd will never be dragged off by the wolf. Stay close to Jesus. Look at Psalm 1611, another beautiful one. There's so many more verses that we could have looked at. But look at Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Isn't that a beautiful picture of being close with Jesus, of being close to God? You fill me with joy in your presence. And some of us this morning, please don't take this the wrong way, but some of us this morning would say, I'm not full of joy. May I suggest to you that sometimes we don't really stay close to Jesus long enough for him to fill us with joy, do we? Let's be honest. We run in. Let me read my Bible. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, how many of you, I'm going to read my Bible every day this year. You've already got a list, right? Yep. And, and we make, okay, I've got to do this. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with determining I'm going to read the Word of God every day this year. That's a great resolution. That's a great commitment to make. Sometimes the Lord doesn't want to tick off any list. Sometimes the Lord just says, Come spend some time with me. Get close to me. Spend some time with me. I want to fill you with joy. I need that, don't you? I need that. And I think some of us need that as well. Take some time to get close to him and let him minister to you. Let him heal you. Let him strengthen you. Let him take the broken pieces and begin to put them back together. He does that in his presence. He does that when we're close to him. To overcome this year, stay close. Stay close to God. Stay close to God. Amen. Amen. The next one is not quite so inspiring, but I felt that I should put it in. Stay in good company. So the first one is stay in the truth. The second one was stay close to Jesus. And I prayed about it. I said, Lord, this one's not very sublime. Are you sure? And the Lord said, yep, put it in. I felt that he said that. Stay in good company. 
Um, and I just want to give you one, I want to give you one psalm. It's a psalm that I, do you know which one it is? Think about it. It's from the Psalms. It's one of the psalms that um, my mother in Singapore gave me, I think it was probably 10 cents, I don't know. Way back then, 10 cents was a lot of money. Um, 10, 10 Singapore cents. Uh, that we got to memorize scripture. Blessed is, I learned at King James, and here I am, lo, these many years later. I, I learned it when I was in the single digits, maybe six years old, and I'm in the double digits now. I'm, I'm well into them. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Stay in good company. Oh, I know the rest of it, too. <laughs> Parents, honestly, Give your kids money to memorize scriptures. I have no problem with that. Do you know that mom, when she was here in Hong Kong, she, used, she was teaching a, a group of ladies over on Hong Kong Island. Actually, it was a group of Thai Thais. It really was. Very, very wealthy group of ladies over on Hong Kong Island. And she used to give them little gifts and money to memorize things from the Word of God. And here, are, here were these ladies who had money in their bank account a million times over, but to win a little prize, oh, they were memorizing. Do what you need to do to get the Word of God in your, ki in your children's hearts and in your lives. It will, it will change their lives. And this has made such a difference in my life. But just very simply, and I won't take long on this one because I do want to look at these other things. Stay in good company. This is such a simple, it's such a, a simple passage. But if we, if you and I are going to overcome this year, we're going to have to be careful about our company, about those that, we, those that we're the closest with. Now, the New Testament, you say, oh, pastor, you're just being judgmental. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Because the Bible says uh, in, the, in, in the New Testament, it talks about those that we are close to. And there's no way the Bible says, it, it doesn't say, oh, you can, you can just step out of the world. Of course not. We're, we, are, we live in this world. We're around people. But here's this picture of someone who is blessed, the blessings of God are overflowing in his or her life because of his, the choice of close companions. That's really what this means. And these three words, walk, stand, or sit, it has to do with lifestyle choices, okay? And without going into a lot of details, because I, 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 I wasn't gonna take a long time on this, but if you look at this, I, I just want to encourage you. When you're going through hard times, look at number one. Blessed is the man who does not, or woman, who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. I sometimes talk with Christians who have gotten all messed up in their lives because they have gotten their counsel from people that, that totally outside the word of God, totally, totally non-godly wisdom. Well, you should do this. They did this? Well then. Well, you should whatever. All sorts of things. And they start walking in the counsel of the ungodly, if you want to think about it in that way. And, they're, and they wonder why their lives are such a mess. And they wonder why their relationships are all messed up. God says we're blessed. <coughs> Excuse me. We're blessed when we do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. <coughs> Or stand in the way of sinners. Uh, in, in this one, uh, the way of the sinner. Well, we're all sinners, aren't we? We're sinners saved by grace. This means somebody who is, who is sin is a part of their lifestyle. They know it. They're happy with it. It doesn't bother them. This is how they're living their lives. Don't let someone like that be close to your heart. Don't let someone like that speak into your life. Or sit in the seat of mockers. And I... I I hesitated to include this, 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 this passage because I think this one hits kind of close to home. But I find sometimes in the family of God that there are mockers in the family of God, scoffers, people who, who speak lightly of the things of God. 
people who, who don't have good things to say about the family of God, about the church, about others. And those, those are mockers and those are scoffers. And I want to say to you, if this is, don't let it be part of your life. Don't let it be part of your conversation. And if somebody is that way, encourage them in a better way. And if the Bible's very clear about it as well, if they continue in that way, step back. Step back, because you want to overcome. You want to overcome. You want to be able to make it this year, don't you? I do. I do. Remember I told you before, Betty and I were in, in uh, Sister Betty and I were in Beijing, and we were going through kind of a tough time. It was tough in those early years, and we found ourselves complaining all the time. Remember that? I gave you this, this example a few months ago. And finally one day, Betty, who's very godly, said, Okay, we can only have one complaint a day. <laughs> Zero complaints is too much to, you know, nobody's that saintly. And so we agreed and it made a difference and it made a difference. And I'm so glad for a godly companion. Choose good company. Stay in good company. And hey, be good company too, right? Be good company as well. Amen. Good company should be found in the family of God. Amen. Okay, so the first one is what? Stay in the truth. Second one is? Stay close. This one is? Stay in good company. Okay. The next one is stay in the word. Stay in the word. Well, that's a no-brainer, isn't it? We know that one. You say, of course, of course. And everything sort of points to this one. So, so without belaboring the point, let me give you some reasons to stay in the word that go beyond, oh, well, you say that because you're a pastor. Yes, I say that because, I say that because I'm your pastor and I want you to overcome. I want you to overcome. What are some reasons to stay in the Word that go beyond ticking off, accomplishing a 365-day goal? Do you know why? I, I have you version on my phone. Do you know why I keep all of my reading plans private? You know, you can join groups. I'm so sorry, Pastor Renee, because he encouraged us to form groups. Do you know why I don't? Because sometimes I don't make it every day. I don't. You say, oh, Pastor, I don't make it every day. Or maybe it's just one verse. Or, 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 or something like that. But I'm talking about on a consistent basis. On a consistent basis. Why do we want to stay in the Word? How will it help us to overcome? Here you go. Are you ready? And most of these are from Psalm 119. Oh, Psalm 119, the best, book, the best chapter in the Bible to talk about the Word of God. I mean it. Best chapter in the Bible. Go to Psalm 119 if you're struggling with staying in the Word of God. Get a good translation, get an easy one that you can read, and you will be so encouraged. Every single verse, and I think there are 176 verses or something like that, every verse except one talks about the Word of God. Every verse. See, now you're going to want to go read it to find out which verse doesn't. <laughs> go read it. Okay, the first one. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. In this new year, in this new decade, you have questions about what you should do, don't you? You have questions about decisions to make. Parents, you've got decisions to make about your children, and some of them are really tough. You may have business decisions. You may have health decisions to make. You may have other decisions. The word of God is a lamp to, your, to guide your feet and a light for your path. You say, well, I went to the Word of God and it didn't tell me anything. May I give you a, a, way, a way to look at that? And please don't, you know, do that thing where you go to the Word of God, choop, you open it up. We've all heard stories about that. Although all of us have done that at one point or another, haven't we? Pretty much. Probably all of us have. And God, in His mercy, Every once in a while, God has answered that way of going to his word, hasn't he? But as a pattern, that's not how God does it. How God guides us and leads us and, put, and shines a light on our pathway is as we take the word of God in on a consistent, on a daily basis, on a daily basis as it comes into our lives. Uh, one of the other psalms, uh, one of the other verses that I didn't write down, uh, and I don't remember it now, but it's in the early part. It says this, the entrance of your word brings light. 
Isn't that a wonderful, isn't that a wonderful verse? The entrance of your word. As the word of God comes into our lives, it gives light. Says, oh, okay, this is the step I should take. And this is what the word of God does. So there's one good reason to stay in the word this year. It will help you overcome. You're going to overcome when you're on the right path. Get off on the wrong pathway all, all the time in Hong Kong. Almost every year, we hear of people that go hiking, and I know some of you really enjoy hiking. Almost every year, we hear of people that go hiking in the mountains and the hills of Hong Kong, and they get off on the wrong path. They've missed the right pathway, and it is fatal, isn't it? It's fatal. That's true physically. It's true spiritually as well. We will overcome as we stay in the right pathway. And bringing the Word of God, staying in the Word, will bring light into our pathway. Are you struggling with sin and temptation in an area of your life? If you are, stay in the Word, and He's going to help you overcome in that area. What, verse 133, God, my steps by your word, so I will not be overcome by evil. Verse 11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is one that we know very well. Here's another one for you. Here's another reason to stay in the Word. Uh, I've used a modern translation here. Verse 143, as pressure and stress bear down on me. Mm, how many of you have pressure and stress bearing down on you? Yep. Or trouble and anguish. We do. I find joy in your commands. I find joy in your commands. Sometimes our externals don't change. But when God fills our heart with joy, we have strength in our bones, don't we, to keep going. And the Word of God will strengthen your inner being that though the stress and the pressure continue, you will be able to bear up. You will be able to overcome this year. You'll make it. You'll make it. Stay in the Word of God. Stay in the Word of God. And then I put this one in as well because you know it's a fight, but i got to go fast now. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm. We go all the way through. Look at verse 12. This is the fight that you're in, brothers and sisters. You think you're fighting people? Nope, you're not fighting people. It's a fight with unseen forces. It's a fight with the enemy. And then Paul writes, so put on every piece of God's armor. Look at verse 17. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. The Word of God. Because there are going to be some battles this year. you got to have the Word of God. You think you're going to withstand temptation? You think you're going to withstand the devil by your willpower? Seriously? Nobody can overcome the devil in that way. Nobody. If Jesus himself said to the enemy, when the enemy came and tempted him, if you're really the Son of God, and Jesus said, it is written... If you're really whatever, and Jesus said again, it is written, and one more time, if you are, do this, and Jesus said, enough of this, it is written, it is written, will put to death and will silence the voice of the enemy that tempts you in areas of sin and weakness when you think you're going to be overcome, stay in the Word of God, stay in truth, pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and it will overcome the enemy. If Jesus did it, we can't do any better than Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you're going to overcome this year, stay in the Word of God. Stay in the Word of God. Very quickly, the final one. Very quickly. Stay in church. Uh, everybody says, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> right? <laughs> you didn't want to end on that one, right? We were on, we were on such a high note, and then we got to stay in church, <laughs> okay? <laughs> wait, wait. Wait, here's another one. Stay with me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> stay with me. Let me answer a question for you. Some of you now are now feeling guilty because maybe you haven't stayed in church so much this last year. Some of you are now feeling condemned because... Or a little bit, or a little bit, who are you to say, blah, 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 blah. You're a pastor, so of course you are. Stay with me just a minute. Let me give you some reasons to stay in church and why it will help you overcome. And I really mean this. And here's one very simply as we look at this, as we stay in church. Because some of us, I, we understand, 
we're, we're busy at times. Sometimes there are activities that are on Sunday that that's just part of it. And s sadly to say, um, those of you who have children in this time, uh, society and schools have changed so much, haven't they? That now things are commonly planned on Sunday. When I was growing up, you know, way back in the dark ages, like a few of you, nothing was planned on Sunday, right? Nothing. You went to church on Sunday. That's not the way it is anymore. And that's the way that the world is going. But what I say to you this morning is stay in church. And here's a good reason. For, here's some good reasons for it. And this answers the question. Because you see, many churches, including Lighthouse, we post sermons. So, okay, well, you know, it's okay if I'm not there. I'm going to look at the mess. I'm going to li listen to the sermon anyhow. I'm going to look at the sermon. So give me a good reason for this. I'm going to give you several good reasons really quickly. Because of God's presence and God's power. God's presence and God's power. Jesus said, stay with me, huh? for where, Jesus said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And this is not God's omnipotence everywhere. It's not God's inner presence with you. It is God's manifest presence, the, the made known presence of God. How many of you this morning, good example, during our time of worship and praise, as we, were in the, as we were worshiping the Lord, you felt the presence of the Lord. He was here. He was touching your heart. Some of you this morning, with the songs that we were singing, as God's presence, as His Holy Spirit was here, flowing among us, He was touching our hearts and He was speaking to us. This morning as we were singing, I felt so distinctly. I, I almost stood up to say something. I thought, no, I don't need to say it. People, at this time, people know it. People know it. Through the very worship the Holy Spirit was speaking to some of you this morning the words that you needed to hear for your situation. This morning. This morning. He was pouring strength into your life. This morning. Why? Because Jesus said, when two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. I'm there in their midst in a special way. I am there in their presence. I am with you. My power will be manifest. My power will be displayed. Nothing, nothing can take the place of the presence of God, the manifest presence and the power of God. Have you ever been in a service? Have you ever been in time when the Holy Spirit, excuse me, was moving and things that weren't right in your life, things that were wrong, with somebody else. The Holy Spirit just started flowing and He made everything right. You didn't even have to go and talk it all out and work it all out and blah, 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 as we sometimes do. The Holy Spirit just took care of it. That is one of the reasons, brothers and sisters, the manifest presence and power of God is present <clears throat> among His people when they gather in His name. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there among them. Very quickly, very quickly. This is right after, and this, so I wanted to give you an Old Testament. You know I love Old Testament examples too. The children of Israel had made the golden calf and then had descended into an orgy. Basically, that's what it was. I mean, it, was, it was a terrible thing. And God said, I am not going with these people to the promised land. Okay, Moses, I'll send my angel. I, he's going to do what he said he's going to do, but I'm not going with you. And look at what Moses said. Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. Brothers and sisters, it is the presence of God that makes a difference in our lives. It is the presence of God that makes a difference when we gather or else it's just a, it's more exciting at a rugby match. It's, it's more interesting at a concert or something like that. But it is the presence of God when we gather in His name. He is there with us. His presence and His power that will transform our lives, that will take care of things, that will do what no one else can do. It is His presence that makes the difference. It makes all the difference. And so when I say stay in church, Here's one of the primary reasons. Yes, God is with us when we cannot be in church and gathered in His name. But I urge you, brothers and sisters, I urge you that you make it a priority. If you can't, there, I know there are business trips. I know there's traveling. I know all those things. So please, 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 
I'm not speaking a single word of condemnation this morning. I mean it. No condemnation. But I urge you, here's a good reason. To over, if you're going to overcome this year, stay in church. Because as you are, the presence and the power of God is manifest. I'm going to go very quickly because we've got to come to a close. Stay in church. Why? God's people. God's people. Some of you say, another, another whatever. I just, just me and God, just me and God. Well, apart from having grammatical problems, there's some theological problems with that as well. Do you know why? Because God has planned for his presence and his power and the encouragement that comes, it comes through God's people. It really does. It comes through God's people. And here's the scripture. Here's just one. There are many more, but here's one scripture for you. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14. Look at all these wonderful things that God has for you. But you know what? Look at it. He doesn't give it to you. He gives it to somebody else in the family of God. And what you need, God gives somebody else. And what somebody else need, needs, God gives you for them. That's the way he planned it. That's the way he planned it. This is easy, brothers and sisters. It really is. It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. God doesn't want any Lone Ranger Christians. That's when we are at our most vulnerable. It really is. If you're going to overcome this year, you're going to have to stay in church. I, I, for your sake. It's not, oh, look, we had so many in church. Isn't that great? Oh, great. They'll put money in the offering. No. No, no, no. God is so much bigger than that. God's gathering and God's church, God's family is so much bigger than that. God's presence and his power and his people together make the difference in our lives, especially as the day approaches. Especially. Let us encourage one another and all the more now that the day of his... Sorry, so you got that. Hebrews 10.25. Hebrews 10.25. So our keys to overcoming, brothers and sisters... I'm going to pray for you. I'll leave this up just a minute. You said, I knew all that. I know you knew all that. I knew all that too. But this is God's word for us. I want you to make it. Pastor Renee wants you to make it. But I want to tell you something. So much more important than your pastors. God wants you to make it this year. He's for you. He loves you. And he gives you keys to make it. So just let me pray for you, and if, I don't know, all of these may have hit you, one or two of these may have hit you, just take it and just say, okay, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And take it into your heart and respond to the Lord this morning. Lord, we come to you this morning. Lord, I bring to you your people, your flock, your sheep that you love for whom you died for whom you won the victory, for whom you gave everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of you. And Lord, I pray that our hearts are open to what you say to us this day. Father, may there be no hint of condemnation in any heart, in any thought, but we receive, O oh Lord, the word of encouragement that you speak to us that we might overcome this year through you. For if God be for us, who can be against us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.